In that video, you just saw a 17-year-old boy catch a two-year-old girl after she plummeted from an open window. The 17-year-old's name was Fuzi Zabat, and this happened in 2019 in Istanbul. On that day, Fuzi was just walking down the street when he noticed that a young girl was playing near an open window in her family's apartment. He decided to stick around at the base of the window, and that's when the absolutely unthinkable happened. Two-year-old Syrian toddler Doha Muhammad actually flew out of the window. But thankfully, Fuzi was right there and he actually was able to catch her before she hit the ground. Now, obviously, this young man has been credited with saving this girl's life. I mean, the video is frightening and terrifying, but at the end of the day, there's a good story behind it. After all this happened, that video went absolutely viral and Fusey was hailed as a hero across the world. It's just absolutely wild to me to think about the fact that he was there at that exact moment that he was needed and he was actually able to save this little girl's life through his extremely heroic actions that day. How is it possible for two people to vanish into thin air? On the night of February 25th, just last month, best friends and business partners Jason Salter and Kenny Guerra went to meet up in East Point, Georgia. They haven't been seen since. The two men were reported missing the next day after they completely stopped answering phone calls at around 4.30 the day prior and after failing to return home to their families. During the search for the men, authorities found Jason's Nissan Altima near Campbellton Road Southwest in Atlanta. In a completely different location, they found Kenny's BMW at the reserve at Birch Creek apartment complex. After running the tags on Jason's car, police discovered that traffic cameras captured it at around 6.48 p.m. on the day they disappeared on Campbellton Road Southwest, but it's unclear who was actually driving the car. Both of their cell phones have also since been found, and authorities are trying to piece together a timeline and track their last movements. Jason and Kenny are known as true best friends, and they also own a print shop together in South Fulton County. Kenny's son has since celebrated a birthday without him, and according to his family, Kenny would not miss that for the world. If you have any information on the disappearance of these two men, please contact the East Point Police Department at 404-761-2177. A man woke up during his own autopsy. This case is truly like something from a horror film. It was 2007 in Carcass, Venezuela. Carlos Camajo was 33 years old. He'd actually unfortunately been involved in a really bad car accident. Now, in the horror crash, he was mistakenly identified as being deceased. He was declared dead and taken to a local mortuary. They had no idea that he was actually very much alive, just unconscious. Carlos described feeling a horrific pain. As he woke up, a medical examiner was actually inserting a knife into him as part of his autopsy. As they sliced into his face, they realised something was terribly wrong because he started bleeding. Now, deceased people don't usually bleed because after around six hours, the blood starts to set in the body. They feared something had gone wrong and started to stitch him back up. Meanwhile, his heartbroken wife had been told that he'd passed away and was heading over to the mortuary to actually identify him. Imagine her shock when she saw him not deceased, but just wandering around the corridors. Carlos described the pain that he experienced during his autopsy as unbearable. This man was chewing gum when it suddenly exploded, killing him. In December 2009, Vladimir, a 25-year-old chemistry student of Kiev Polytechnic Institute, was killed when his chewing gum exploded in his mouth. Vladimir had a peculiar habit of dipping his chewing gum in citric acid to enhance its sour taste. On his work table, authorities found about 100 grams of unidentified explosive powder, which he used for his chemistry studies at home. This powder, however, was found to be four times stronger than TNT. It is believed that Vladimir accidentally confused the explosive powder with citric acid and coated his gum with it before putting it in his mouth and chewing it. The explosion was possibly triggered by the reaction of the explosive powder with Vladimir's saliva or the pressure exerted by him chewing on the gum and explosive powder. The explosion resulted in a severe injury that blew off Vladimir's jaw completely and despite immediate attention from emergency services, they were unable to save him. This is absolutely insane, and just imagine putting a piece of gum in your mouth, and then seconds later, your head literally explodes from it. This is one of the most random and brutal deaths I've ever covered, and may Vladimir rest in peace. This is absolutely awful, and what are the odds of this?
The Egyptian woman that you just saw in that video, Manar Sami, was sentenced to three years in prison for the content she posted on TikTok. But what exactly was she posting on TikTok that got her sent to prison? Well, nothing out of the ordinary. Dancing, lip syncing, and basic innocuous content. But she was arrested in 2020 on charges of, I'm going to read this to you, inciting debauchery, immorality, and stirring up instincts. Yes, she was arrested for immorality and inciting debauchery with her dancing TikTok videos. Well, Minar, like I said, was eventually sentenced to three years in prison. This happened back in 2020 when a number of Egyptian female TikTok influencers were randomly targeted and sentenced to prison time. After being found guilty, she was also ordered to pay 300,000 Egyptian pounds to the government. She did eventually get out of prison though, and she's still active here on TikTok and over on Instagram too. I just couldn't believe it when I saw that video and saw that content like that got her sentenced to three years in prison. It's pretty wild to me. These kids found a nuclear fallout shelter underneath the city of Chicago. So we all know what a nuclear fallout shelter is. And their sole purpose is to protect you from a nuclear war or just a nuclear bomb. But the video I'm about to show you shows a group of friends finding a nuclear shelter under Chicago and it's literally an entire city. It's got a bank, hospital, gym, and everything. And just wait to see how clean it looks. This means that somebody goes down there consistently and cleans it. Meaning, is something going to happen soon? Mandela effects they're pretty popular and shit let me know if you guys are surprised you obviously know Toy Story right yeah the famous lines that Woody says there's a snake on my boot a lot of people remember it as that as well there's a snake in my boot but the whole time is there's a snake in my boots this one it was over there's a snake in my boot which it doesn't make sense as why it would be boots yeah if it says a snake not there's snakes in my boots Yep. Maybe I was just a jit and I no, never bro. noticed it, bro. No, bro. It's not that. Because look at the title. I didn't know about that one. Now this one, right? You know, in school, they teach us about geography and shit, mountains and rivers, right? Do you remember getting taught what is the longest river in the United States? Uh, is it the Mississippi River? So a lot of people... <laughs> what? No, no, no. Remember no. it as the Mississippi River. This whole time, it's the fucking Missouri River. What the fuck is even the Missouri River? I've never heard about the Missouri I River. I have never heard about the Missouri River either. Was I that much of a dumbass? Let's search this up real quick, bro. What? They're literally the same fucking thing. Blood's changed it, bro. You know what it is, maybe? We were always taught how to spell Mississippi, how much S's it has, how much I's it has. How long the word. Are all professional sports rigged? Watch this video and let me know what you think. I was like, listen, the closeout game is the hardest game in your life. And they'd be like, why? And I can't say. <laughs> can't say. I can't say, but I'm like, no, fam. Listen, like, this is the hardest game you'll ever play in your life. Shit, nah, I'll tell it. Like, <laughs> go ahead. You gotta be the, the vehicle. The vehicle. You gotta right. be the vehicle. No, it's real though. No, no, I remember we were about to play game seven, uh, 2012. So we were about to play the Celtics or whatever. Game seven. So I'm hyped as hell. I'm like, yeah, bro, we got a game seven. Like, we're out the damn. Like, this is gonna be lit. So Eldon's like, you know we're gonna have to win by 15, just win by one. Mm. So I'm like, what you mean? He's like, bro, this is the NBA, it's entertainment. Like, LeBron is in a heat or waiting. Would you rather watch the Celtics or the Sixers play the heat? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm on the team. I wouldn't even watch <laughs> the Sixers play the heat type <laughs> shit. Like, so we get in this game, you know how much money the NBA is going to lose. Like, this, you know, type shit. I'm like, I guess, like, a decent amount. It's like, would you watch that game next week if it was a heat versus the Sixers? I'm like, nah. It's like, okay then. So, like, 
That's why I'm, I'm telling you, take M's and M's from this. I'm like, what? He's like, millions of memories. Because this is entertainment. Damn, what's a bar? This man was executed in 2015 after what he claimed was an April Fool's joke went wrong. Lin Sen Hao was a university student in Shanghai at a prestigious university and he says that he decided to play an April Fool's prank on his roommate by spiking the drinking water in their room with drugs. He was an intern at a hospital lab and he had access to NDMA. He spiked the water dispenser in his room leading his roommate to get poisoned. His roommate Huang Yang drank the water from the water dispenser on April 1st and he immediately became poorly. He didn't die until the 16th of April when his organs failed and his body completely shut down. He'd actually told his father that the water tasted funny and he'd actually cleaned out the dispenser so that nobody else drank it. He was the only one that drank the water and his roommate said it was just a prank and it had gone wrong. Prosecutors argued that that couldn't be the case. He worked in a lab and he'd worked with this drug using it on animals so he knew exactly how much it would take to kill someone. The judging court ruled that the act was malicious and he had intentionally poisoned his roommate and he sentenced him to death. He had a 10 minute visit with his father before he was executed in which he said sorry multiple times. He still professed his innocence and said that it was a prank gone wrong and he was executed in November 2015. Nobody in the entire world can visit this island. Okay, so majority of Americans don't know about the forbidden island in Hawaii that is owned by one single family and nobody could visit. The island is called Nihau and it's extremely different from anything else in the United States. There is only a population of 70 people, and they have no access to paved roads, telephone service, no running water, and the majority of the island lives off welfare checks from the US government. And with such harsh living conditions, it makes you wonder why anybody would even live on this island. And the real question is, if there's nothing to hide here, why can't anybody visit? Well, this rule that doesn't allow any outsiders onto the island was actually written into the agreement by the natives when they sold it to the Robinson family, all the way back in 1864. The Robinson family bought the island for $10,000 in gold, which is $325,000 today. And the crazy thing is that this family still owns the island. The Robinsons are also very focused on preserving the Hawaiian culture on this island that the natives did, so they go to church every Sunday, banned long hair for men, and kept the official Hawaiian language. But my whole opinion on this island is that if nobody can visit there and there's only 70 people on it, there's gotta be some crazy stuff going on there, right? There's just no way these 70 people are just completely normal living on this isolated island that nobody could visit. Let me know your thoughts on this and also let me know if you've ever heard of this. One fatal error meant this man was dragged by a roller coaster and thrown to his death. It was 2003 near Seattle in Washington. Doug McKay had been placed in charge of the family carnival business by his dad. Doug and his wife Sherry co-owned Paradise Amusements, which was based in Idaho. They ended up getting a contract with Whidbey Island Fair. On the 16th of August, the pair were at the fun fair inspecting the area. Doug noticed something needed fixing on one of the roller coasters. The ride in question was called the Super Loop 2. The ride was basically a vertical loop. Now, Doug felt that it needed lubricating on one side of the loop. Tragically, like he'd done many times before, Doug actually jumped onto the track while the roller coaster was in motion. Now, he was usually pretty good at this. He was very, very confident just hopping on and off the rides. However, as he sprayed oil onto the track this one day to lubricate the ride, he actually slipped and fell and got caught by his hair. He then became trapped on a carriage. Park goers watched on in horror as he was pulled 40 feet up to the top of the loop and then plunged to his death. Witnesses were then completely traumatised by seeing his body land on a metal fence and virtually split in half. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Horrifically, many children witnessed this as they were on the ride at the time. Now, the fair only postponed rides for an hour after the death. They then continued with the evening's amusements. The next day, the amusement park opened as usual. Doug's wife, Sherry, had promised Doug that if anything was to go wrong, she would keep the show running as usual. 
This might be the craziest and most intense cartel encounter ever. What I'm about to show you is the U.S. Coast Guard raiding a high-speed submarine in the eastern Pacific Ocean moving more than 17,000 pounds of cocaine. On June 18, 2019, a Coast Guard surveillance aircraft tracked the drug-filled narco sub hundreds of miles off the Colombian and Ecuadorian coastline, and the video shows a member of the Coast Guard riding on top of the speeding sub pounding on the hatch and demanding it to come to a stop. The video then ends with the presumed trafficker emerging from the narco sub putting his hands up in surrender. In total, five alleged smugglers were seized aboard the vessel. Now, just watch this video. It's absolutely insane and it's something straight out of a video game. Multiple videos of this incident were going around social media yesterday and honestly I've not been able to stop thinking about it since. It's horrifying, quick trigger warning for this one because honestly it's just awful. This is a still from one of the videos that I have watched, I wish I hadn't. Um, I absolutely will not put it on here, I've blurred it out because it's just horrific. In this apartment block were a woman, her two children and her mother-in-law. At some point yesterday morning she had some sort of manic episode in which she stabbed her mother-in-law. She then grabbed her three-year-old son, took him over to the window of the apartment block and dangled him outside the window. She held him outside the window by his arms. You can see that he's trying to climb back inside. I cannot imagine how terrified and confused he must have been. Authorities did act quickly and they put an inflatable cushion on the ground in order to catch him if she did drop him. But she saw this cushion and she moved around to the side of the apartment and dropped him out of this window. Police were trying to gain access to the apartment at this point and they managed to do so just as she grabbed her other child and tried to do the same thing to him. In the video she is saying, I'm sick, I'm sick. Apparently this was a manic episode. She was having some sort of mental health breakdown. In China, this sort of crime is usually met with the death sentence, but if she pleads insanity, she might not even get prison time. This has happened before in China. I didn't know about this case until I started researching the one that happened yesterday, but this is a couple who were having an affair and this woman didn't want to raise someone else's children. So their father did the same thing to them. He dropped them off the balcony and they both passed away. They were one and two. This couple have now been executed in January this year. I'm going to keep a close eye on this one because I'll be interested to see whether she does plead insanity or whether she gets sentenced to death. This couple had triplets after losing all three of their children in a fatal car crash. The lives of Lori and Chris Coba were forever changed after a horrific tragedy. Lori was driving down the California freeway heading home with her three children, four-year-old Emma, two-year-old Katie, and five-year-old Kyle when a big truck carrying 40,000 pounds while speeding crashed into the back of their minivan. The impact was devastating and each Kobo family member was transferred to separate hospitals. Then came the earth-shattering news. Chris Kobo learned that all three of his children had passed away. Miraculously, Lori survived though she had no memory of the fatal crash at all. Her husband had to tell her what happened and that their babies were gone. While Lori and Chris attempted to piece their lives back together with the support of their community, they felt a calling to ensure that Emma, Katie, and Kyle did not die in vain. Lori and Chris then felt another calling to try and have another child. The couple turned to IVF treatments and just six months after the accident, Lori discovered she was pregnant. Almost exactly nine months later, Lori gave birth to triplets, two girls and one boy named Ashley, Ellie, and Jake. The triplets were conceived through in vitro fertilization and were born healthy. 
The Cobbles believed that the birth of their triplets was a miracle and that their deceased children had a hand in crafting it. They have since started a foundation in memory of their children which provides scholarships to students who have lost siblings. This case is both horrific and absolutely mind-blowing. This couple lost three of their children, two girls and one boy, and then had triplets that were two girls and one boy. If this doesn't make you believe in miracles, I don't know what would. Rest in peace to Emma, Katie, and Kyle. You were taken from the world way too soon. This couple were eaten alive by a grizzly bear captured on harrowing video footage. It was October 2003. Timothy Treadwell was a 46-year-old grizzly bear enthusiast. He famously claimed that he felt more at home in nature with the bears than in normal human society. He spent a total of 13 summers in Alaska's Katmai National Park documenting the giant creatures. He would stun people by how close he got to the giant animals. He said the animals understood him and that there was a mutual respect, and he would even occasionally wrestle with the baby cubs. Park rangers, though, were warning Timothy about how unpredictable the animals could be. This was what Timothy lived for, though. He seemed very willing to take the huge risk of getting up close and personal with these beautiful bears. Now, Timothy began to get complacent. On one occasion, he even left food open inside of his tent. Rangers had to warn him not to do this. Now, in the autumn in question, he was actually with his girlfriend, Amy, at the park. Now, they usually only stayed for the summer, but this year they were there much later into October. Bears are known to be a little bit more anxious and antagonistic this time of year as they are preparing for hibernation and food supplies are less. On the 5th of October, Timothy and his girlfriend were due to be picked up. They were getting a plane out of the national park, but when the pilot turned up, they were nowhere to be found. Near the campsite, the pilot stumbled upon something terrifying. A human rib cage lay on the floor. Park rangers were called and they were met by a terrifying bear. It tried to attack them, so they killed it. Human remains were later found in its stomach. They were the remains of Timothy and Amy. Timothy's video camera was later recovered from the campsite. The camera had captured the couple's brutal death. The audio from the camera was rolling and it picked up Timothy screaming that he was being killed out here. Amy then shouts at him to play dead and then encourages him to fight back. Tragically, they were both eaten by the grizzly bear. The video you're about to see is the last video ever taken of 18-year-old Cameron Robbins who disappeared after jumping off of a cruise ship. Cameron had just graduated from high school on May 21st of this year, and to celebrate, he and a bunch of his friends went on a cruise to the Bahamas. They were all aboard the Blackbeard's Revenge Cruise, which was put together by an independent company called Grad Week. On May 24th, at around 9.40 p.m., Cameron was dared to jump off of the cruise ship. The weather was reportedly pretty bad that night, and they were near the uninhabited Athol Island in Montagu Bay. After being dared, a group of students tried to physically stop Cameron, but he broke free and jumped off the boat anyway. In the video, you can hear students screaming for him to grab the buoy, but he quickly drifted away. The ship's crew executed the man overboard protocol, and since then, the US Coast Guard has searched over 325 square miles, but Cameron has never been found. And on May 27th, the search was officially called off. Cameron is presumed dead and has since been declared lost at sea, which is the same as a death certificate. After the video of him jumping off the boat went viral, a lot of people thought they could see a shadowy object move towards Cameron in the corner, and a lot of people believe that that could be a shark. According to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, the boat was in shark-infested waters that night, and in that area there is a variety of marine life, including dolphins, tiger sharks, and bull sharks. But experts have stated that the video is too dark and blurry to know what exactly happened. And upon request from the Robbins family, the shark theory is no longer being investigated. Cameron was described as a fierce athlete who even continued pitching with a broken hand. But off the field, he was a funny, kind-hearted person who loved to go fishing and was always down for karaoke. He was also a leader in his church's youth group. A GoFundMe for Cameron's family has been set up and is attached to my profile if you'd like to donate. The EDP 445 story is disturbing. And if you don't know the details of this, you really should keep watching. So EDP was known for ranting, making funny videos on YouTube. At the time that he was caught, he had millions and millions of subscribers and he was an avid fan of the Philadelphia Eagles. And he had a lot of fans. He really was a celebrity on YouTube. 
He would do cooking videos. He would react to things. People always used his voice and his image in different memes and reaction videos. But in July 2020, the world would begin to view him in a very different light. So in July of 2020, some disturbing messages began to surface that EDP had sent fans. In one chat, he requested to be a 16-year-old's boyfriend and asked for some help in some activities. He was also seen requesting pictures from children, if you know what I mean, what kind of pictures I'm talking about, in payment for merch and other goods. And yeah, at that point, there was a lot of video evidence that he was attracted to minors and was actively trying to seek one out to abuse. But nobody really believed that he would be that dumb to go out and do it. Obviously, I think he should have been canceled already based on what he had been saying, but that leads us to 2021. So in April of 2021, EDP was caught in an online predator sting put on by the group Predator Poachers. Apparently in the chats of these predator hunters had had with EDP 445, he had exposed his uh, private areas. He had talked very graphically about what he wanted to do with this supposed 13 year old child. And yeah, this entire time EDP thought he was talking to a 13 year old girl, but he was talking to this guy. Obviously, this was extremely problematic, and in a lot of these cases, the people who exchange these messages with people pretending to be minors actually end up being arrested and sent to jail or prison. And while you think this may have been enough evidence to charge EDP with a crime, it actually wasn't, and the police department opened an investigation but said, due to some flaws in the actual sting operation itself, they couldn't charge him. So nowadays, I've heard a lot about EDP and where he's been at. He apparently can't keep a job, he can't get housing, and hopefully some sort of charge will be brought up one day, but I'm just not too sure that it ever will. There has been an absolutely horrific murder this week that was live streamed on Instagram. This case is extremely disturbing, so please be warned before watching. On Friday, 12,000 people watched a Bosnian bodybuilder kill his wife on Instagram live. 35-year-old Nermin had been abusing his wife during their marriage and the pair had a young child. On Friday morning, he took to Instagram Live to tell his followers that they could witness a live killing. Absolutely horrifically, he turns the camera to his ex whose face is completely covered in blood and disfigured. He calls her a derogatory name and blames her for her own death because she reported him to police. Disturbingly, you can hear the child crying in the background. He then tells his followers that he's the child's father and his ex had hidden the toddler from him for over a week and reported him to police for DV. So in my opinion, yes, she's taking steps to keep her and her child safe from you. After shooting his wife in the head on Instagram, he then goads his followers saying, someone come and save the child. A police chase then began and he went on a shooting rampage. He continued to film and tells his viewers that he's killed two other people who actually turned out to be an innocent man and his young son. He also wounded a police officer, another man and a woman while on the run. He ended up unaliving himself on the same day. This girl is proof that a lot of rock stars are pedophiles. And this is extremely sad. So this is Lori Maddox. And as Wikipedia states, she's a former child model and a baby groupie of the 1970s. So when she was only 13 years old, Lori started frequenting clubs in West Hollywood like the Whiskey A Go Go. And in June of 1972, when she was only 13 years old, Lori was, as she claims, kidnapped. Lori had been kidnapped by Led Zeppelin's tour manager, a man named Richard Cole. Lori was then brought to Led Zeppelin guitar player Jimmy Page's room and basically kept there. Basically, Jimmy, who was 28 years old at the time, told Lori that he said he'd have her, so it's time to have her. And that started off their relationship. Jimmy reportedly kept this secret because he knew that it was wrong. It was statutory rape. He was 28 years old and she was only 13. And he went to great lengths to make sure that nobody would see him and Lori out in public. This included keeping her in secluded rooms where no one could see the two together. But their relationship is extremely well documented. And yes, this makes Jimmy Page a pedophile. But Jimmy wasn't the only adult that Lori was involved with while she was a minor. According to Lori, she actually lost her virginity to David Bowie. Yes, once again, while she was a teenager. And she also claimed to have slept with Mick Jagger when she was only 17. Now, the photos of Lori Maddox are extremely sad and disturbing, especially when you realize that all the men in these pictures are very old, 28, 30, 32. And in these photos, Lori is literally a teenage girl. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, and it really perplexes me as to why people don't talk about this more. 
Like nowadays, there's a massive discussion, a reckoning of things that have happened in the past. And yet with a lot of these classic rockers who had established relationships with minors, many of them physical in nature, they seem to just get glossed over. Now, Lori Maddox in her adult years actually came out and said that she couldn't wish this fate on her daughter. Here's a quote from her. She said, I don't think underage girls should sleep with guys. I wouldn't want this for anybody's daughter. My perspective is changing as I get older and more cynical. So who knows at the end of the day exactly what all happened to Lori Maddox and who did what with her. But this story is extremely sad and disturbing and really makes you wonder how many of these old classic rock people did stuff like this and what stories and things that they've done will never come to light because they've been hidden so well. If you want to listen to more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. This is one of the most harrowing cases of child murder I've ever heard. Sylvia Likens was born into a disadvantaged family in Indiana. Her parents were traveling carnival workers and they didn't have much money. In 1965, Sylvia's mum was jailed for shoplifting. Sylvia and her sister ended up being placed in the care of a family friend. This was Gertrude Bazanuski. Sylvia's dad had offered the woman $20 a week to straighten his daughters out. Now she already had seven children of her own and also didn't have much money. One week, Sylvia's dad's payment to Gertrude was late. Gertrude decided to punish Sylvia. She dragged her into a room and tortured her with a paddle and a belt while her little sister had to listen on outside. Sylvia's dad actually sent the money a day later, but things would only get worse. Gertrude started to regularly beat the girls. Sometimes when she was too tired, she would make her own teenage daughter Paula join in. On one occasion, Paula hit Sylvia so hard she broke her own wrist. Horrifically, Gertrude started beating Sylvia and telling her sister if she didn't join in, she would be next. Over an agonizing three months, Sylvia was force fed until she threw up, forced to eat the sick, had her fingers burnt, she was used as an ashtray, she was forced to lick dirty nappies and had salt rubbed into her wounds. She was given scalding hot baths until she passed out and then had her head banged against the wall until she regained consciousness. All of this abuse was subjected to her by Gertrude and her children. Now there are some details about what they did to her that I just can't include on a TikTok video. On one occasion, Gertrude's children, along with help from other children in the local area, used a heated needle to tattoo some words onto Sylvia's stomach. The words were to the effect of, I'm an S worker and proud of it. Sylvia spent so many months in this house being absolutely tormented. Just before she died, she actually predicted that she would. Now, Gertrude made Sylvia write a letter, almost to act as an alibi when she knew she was eventually going to kill her. She made Sylvia write about how she'd run away with some local boys. Heartbreakingly, Sylvia made a desperate attempt to escape, but was actually caught. Gertrude then encouraged a local boy called Coy to help her beat Sylvia to death. They striked her with a curtain pole and dragged her to the basement. Now, a neighbour actually apparently heard the commotion, but just decided not to ring police. Sylvia's heartbreaking final words were that she wished her daddy was there. Gertrude ended up panicking and calling police. When they came and discovered Sylvia's dead body, she claimed that she found her like that. She gave police the letter that Sylvia had written about running away with the boys, but the police just didn't buy this story. Gertrude initially denied having any involvement in the death, and then she's decided to try and blame her children for it. She said that it was mainly her daughter Paula and the local boy. Gertrude ended up only being sentenced to 20 years in prison. She spent eight years there before dying of lung cancer. Paula spent eight years in prison for second degree murder. Three boys were convicted of manslaughter and given just two years. Hammer, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. I have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with grey hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer and cannibal. This doctor was so obsessed with his former patient that he removed her corpse from its tomb and lived with it for seven years. This is the twisted story of Carl Tanzler. Carl Tanzler was born in the German Empire in the year 1877. He eventually emigrated to the United States back in the year 1926, and he got a job at a hospital in Key West, Florida, where he worked as a radiology technician. So while he was young, Carl claimed that he was visited by the ghost of a dead ancestor. And this ancestor told him that his true love would be a dark-haired woman. 
And it was while he was working at this hospital when a young tuberculosis patient named Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos came in. She was quickly diagnosed with tuberculosis and Carl took personal care over her. Now, even though Carl Tanzler didn't have a lot of expert medical knowledge, he still decided to become the one that would take care of Elena. So he frequently went over to her house with all of his equipment, he treated her with x-rays, experimental techniques, and he really tried to keep her alive, but unfortunately she died. Now, keep in mind, during this time, Carl was also showering her in gifts and professing his love to her, but it's never been reported that Elena ever showed any sort of interest to him, as she was married at the time that she died to a different guy. So, after she died, Elena was buried in an above-ground tomb in Key West. And on one particularly spooky evening in 1933, Carl Tanzler crept through the cemetery with a toy wagon and stole Elena's corpse from her tomb. Carl would later claim that before he stole the corpse, he would repeatedly visit Elena's grave. And that when he would go there, he would sing her songs and her spirit would reveal herself to him. And her ghost reportedly told Carl to take her from the grave. So, that's what he did. And that's how we get to this terrifying picture of Elena's corpse. So, back at his house, Carl Tanzer attached all of Elena's bones together with piano wire and gave her glass eyes. And because her skin was decomposing rapidly, he covered her in a layer of wax and plaster of Paris. He also fashioned a wig for her out of Elena's actual hair, which she had reportedly obtained from her mother before her death. So Carl would live with this corpse. This was He acted like this was actual Elena in the flesh. He would douse her in perfume to hide the smell of a rotting corpse, and he would frequently dress Lena in different dresses. One neighbor even reported seeing Carl dancing in the moonlight with the corpse through an open window of his home. And according to some reports that eventually came out, Carl Tanzer actually had a tube inserted into this plaster of Paris uh, molding of the body, if you know what I mean, where the tube was and what he was doing with this sculpture body. Eventually, though, after he had been living with the corpse for seven years, rumors began to circulate around the town of Key West that Carl Tanzler was living with the body of a dead woman. And Elena's sister, hearing this, went to Carl's home to confront him, saw the body of her sister, and immediately went to the authorities. Carl Tanzler was then arrested and charged with various things, but because the statute of limitations had expired, he was never actually charged with anything or served any prison or jail time for this, and the charges were dropped. And I gotta say, this is one of the most disturbing stories of all time. Elena's body was eventually reburied in an unmarked grave in the same cemetery. And later in life, Carl Tanzer would actually make another reproduction of Elena's body. And it's been reported that he died in this reproduction's arms. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant. The murder and torture of Junko Furuta is one of the most disturbing stories I've ever read. We're going to cover some extremely graphic details with this story in order to tell the full story, so please, viewer discretion is advised. So this is Junko Furuta. She was born on January 18, 1971. And eventually, she would be murdered at the age of 17 after being trapped in a virtual hell for 40 days. So in school, Junko was a very great student. 
She barely ever missed class, her friends loved her, she was popular, and she one day dreamed of becoming an idol singer. But all those dreams would be shattered in November of 1988. That's when these four teenage boys come into the picture. Hiroshi Miyano, Joe Wagura, Shinji Minato, and Yasushi Watanabe. Throughout all of their youth, these four boys were hardcore criminals. They had damaged school property, committed a number of thefts, assaulted people, and not one of them was a good person. So on November 25th, 1988, two of these boys walked around the town that they lived in with the intent of assaulting and stealing money from a woman. Somehow, by chance, they came across Junko. As she was coming home from work that day riding her bike, one of the boys kicked her off the bike and the other boy pretended to just come across her and wanted to help her. So, trusting that this guy would help her, she followed this boy and he led her to a warehouse where he assaulted her. He then assaulted her in a hotel. And after this, he called his other friends and told them that he had abducted this girl, Junko. So at about 3 a.m., he took Junko to a park where the other three boys were waiting. They found a notebook in her backpack and said that they now know her address. And if she tries to escape, they'll have the Yakuza or the Japanese Mafia kill her. And they then took her to a house where they gang assaulted her. So this house that they brought Junko to was owned by one of the boy's parents. And they held her captive in the house. After they abducted her, they realized that her parents would be filing police reports and looking for her, so they had Junko call her mom and dad and say that she had run away and she was safe. But in reality, she was being held hostage in this home with these four boys. And Junko would be held in this house for 40 days of pure hell. And at this point, I'm going to really advise you if you have a weak stomach to scroll on because this is where the story gets really, really disturbing. And this is a case that I can't, I could never stop thinking about. So for the next 40 days while Junko was held hostage, these four boys, along with other boys and men that they invited to come into the home, repeatedly beat, tortured, and assaulted her. Many times they assaulted her in groups. And the torture that they inflicted on her is some of the most disturbing stuff I've ever read about. While in groups, they would often take turns doing whatever they wanted to Junko. They forcibly shaved her pubic hair. They forced her to dance in front of the group without any clothing on. They forced her to touch areas while they watched, and they would often kick her out to the balcony with no clothing and leave her there overnight. They also inserted lots of different things into her private areas, things that included a bottle, a lit match, a metal rod, and they force fed her copious amounts of milk and alcohol. At one point, these boys even made her smoke multiple cigarettes at once and inhale paint thinner. And in one particularly gruesome incident, one of these boys doused Junko's arms and legs in lighter fluid and set her on fire. And keep in mind, the whole time they were punching, slapping, assaulting her throughout all of this. They also refused to feed her any food and only gave her water, milk, and alcohol. At one point throughout these 40 days, Junko became unable to move due to the infection of her injuries and the extent of her injuries. So she became confined to the floor of the room. And they made her defecate and go to the bathroom on herself and they never cleaned it. So, on January 4th, 1989, one night after one of the boys lost a game the previous evening, he decided to take his anger out on Junko. So, he doused her in lighter fluid, set fire to her body, and she awoke and tried to put it out, but it was no good and she slowly collapsed. The boys then began to punch and kick her unresponsive body. They lit a candle and dripped hot wax across her face. They placed two short candles under her eyelids and lit them, and they even forced her to consume her own urine. Eventually, after she was kicked, she collapsed onto a stereo unit and went into a fit of convulsions, but that didn't stop the attackers. Even though, according to the police report, she was bleeding profusely and pus was pouring out from her infected wounds, these boys continued to savagely attack her. They then dropped a heavy exercise ball onto her stomach multiple times. People think this might have been what finally killed Junko. But this entire ordeal lasted for two hours of beatings, torture, and pain, and that night she died. So after freaking out and realizing that Junko was dead, the boys then placed her body in a 55-gallon tank and filled it to the brim with wet concrete. And throughout her ordeal, Junko had told her captors many times that she regretted only not being able to watch the finale episode of her favorite show titled Dragonfly. And so one of the boys actually found a videotape of that final episode and placed it in there with Junko's body. He would later tell investigators, though, that he didn't do this because he pitied Junko. He did this because he didn't want her ghost to come back and haunt him. So this obviously ended the story of Junko, but eventually, after the police questioned one of the boys for a separate assault and kidnapping that he had committed, he confessed to her murder. And the next day, they went and found this drum, and, of course, they found Junko inside of it. 
Now, this is going to infuriate you if you're still here. The longest sentence handed out to one of these boys was 20 years, and that was the longest sentence. And the other three boys got less than 10 years each for all of these horrific crimes. So all of them are out free in society right now. This is a story that continues to haunt the people in Japan. And if you're still here right now, I'm sure that you're going to be haunted by this story. There are details that I could not include in this TikTok because they were simply too graphic. But thanks for listening. And yeah, I just... This story is one that disgusts me. I cannot believe that they didn't get the sentences that were higher. It's just hard to believe that this happened in real life and that human beings are capable of being this evil. It's just shocking. Sometimes true for strange fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, being killed by shootings, and culminated in acts of cannibalism. I didn't know this was a true crime case. I would think it was a disturbing horror film. On the morning of the 7th of October 2022, a barefoot woman was running around Excelsior Springs, Missouri, bashing on people's doors. Witnesses describe her looking like she came straight from a horror film and she was calling for help. She'd been beaten, held captive and SA'd for weeks. The woman was a shocking sight. She was covered in injuries and was wearing a bin bag. Disturbingly, she was gasping for breath as she had a very tight metal collar locked around her neck. It was a nurse who opened the door to her and let her come in. The nurse started to call police and at this point the woman panicked. She warned her that the captor would kill her and claimed that he had killed her two friends. When police got there, the woman explained that a man called Timothy had captured her the month prior. He'd been holding her hostage this whole time. She said he'd been keeping her locked in the basement and had been SAing her. Disturbingly, she told police that he actually had a young son who lived at the house with him. When Timothy had taken his young son to school the one day, she used it as her opportunity to escape. Police made their way to the home of 39-year-old Timothy Hazlitt Jr. and found the property did in fact have a basement like the woman described. Timothy was arrested and is facing nine charges, including first degree kidnapping. He's being held on a $3 million bond and faces five life sentences. Before his arrest, police were actually called to his address three times. Twice they were asked to do welfare checks and this was from an employer and also family members. Police have searched his home with cadaver dogs and they haven't yet released what they know. The murder of Christina Grimmie, an American pop star and finalist in one season of The Voice is disturbing. Let's dig into this. So before ever even appearing on the TV show The Voice, Christina was huge on YouTube. She began posting covers of popular songs and people loved her voice so she eventually started writing original music. She released her debut EP in 2011 and she soon after hit a million subscribers. And then after hitting 2 million subscribers, she released her full album in 2013. So in 2014, she then auditioned for the TV show, The Voice. Her audition astounded the judges so much that all four of them turned their chairs around and wanted her on their team. She eventually though, chose to be on Adam Levine from Maroon 5's team. Selena Gomez was a huge fan of Christina Grimmie's audition and Justin Bieber even shouted her out towards the end of the season after he had seen covers she had done of his songs on YouTube. So shockingly, Christina didn't win The Voice, but Adam Levine still signed her to his label and she was set to have an amazing career in Hollywood and in the music industry. But that would all change in the year 2016. So on that day, Christina was playing a show at the Plaza Live, a music venue in Orlando, Florida. This was a big show, there were tons of fans that came out, and after the show, like Christina usually did, she stayed around to sign autographs and take pictures with fans. Unfortunately though, during this meet and greet, Christina was approached by 27-year-old Kevin James Loibel. Now, apparently this interaction was really strange. Kevin walked up to her acting super shy, he didn't say a word. Thinking that Kevin was just a shy fan of hers, Christina opened her arms to give him a hug. But that's when Kevin pulled out a Glock pistol and shot her three times at point-blank range. People scattered, Christina Grimmie's brother was there and he tackled Kevin to the ground, preventing him from escaping. But in the ensuing chaos, Kevin broke free, backed up against a wall and took his own life. This photo was actually taken on the night of Christina's murder. It's from her final performance and a photo of some of her final hours on this earth. This was a shocking and sudden event. Christina was a rising star and her life was taken way too young. And people from all across the entertainment industry and the world poured out messages of love and support for Christina. 
And in a strange move, Kevin, the shooter's family, put this note on their front door. They didn't make an official statement or anything. And yeah, I just think that this was really poor taste. Now, strangely enough, Christina's murder took place only four days after the Pulse nightclub shooting that happened in the same city, Orlando, Florida. And in that incident, 49 people were killed. So that was just a tragic week for the community, not only of Orlando, Florida, but for all of America. This guy is one of the most awful serial killers there has ever been, and I feel like he's never talked about. In my opinion, this guy's worse than Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer. Hi Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into the story of The Butcher, the worst serial killer Canada has ever seen. Robert Picton was born October 24th, 1949, in British Columbia, Canada. Robert had quite a bad upbringing. His dad was very abusive. He actually grew up on a pig farm. From a really young age, him and his brother had to work countless hours on this pig farm. And then they were forced to go straight to school without taking a shower or anything. Because he was showing up to school unwashed, Robert started getting bullied and they gave him the nickname Stinky Piggy. As Robert grew older, he was said to be very quiet, but he apparently sometimes had these weird bursts of bizarre behavior. These bursts would come out of nowhere and he would just start acting really strange. In 1996, Robert's brother opened up a kind of charity thing. The charity was started to try to make more money for their pig farm. It was called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society. And what they would do is they would hold huge parties and raves to try and raise money. And I'm not joking when I say huge parties and raves. 17,000 people were said to have shown up at one point. 17,000 people at once. Sex workers and biker gangs would join these parties as well, but for Robert, it all started going downhill in 1997 when he attempted to murder a girl. I don't usually do this in these videos, but a lot of you ask what blush I use, and this is the blush I use. It's usually 10 pounds on the TikTok shop, but it's on for Fiverr right now. So if you click right here, you can get it. I just ordered kind of a peachy version of this. I'm not being paid to talk about this. I just saw they were on offer and you guys ask about these all the time. So get your hands on them for cheap while you can. So Robert attempts to murder a woman for the first time that we know of. According to her statement, he attempted to handcuff her and then he started stabbing her multiple times before she managed to get away. This should have been the thing that got him on police radar, but he was able to get the charges dropped because the woman he attacked was on a lot of drugs at the time and Robert used that to come up with a story. He told police like she was hitchhiking, I was just trying to help her and she attacked me and they believed him because she was on drugs. And unfortunately for the next 60 women he would kill, he was let go and he was able to come up with a strategy that wouldn't get him caught next time. He developed a plan and started killing a bunch of women and Robert was really really good at staying under the radar now what did he do exactly let me tell you because it's just it's disturbing first of all he always went for hitchhikers addicts or prostitutes and what he would do is he would promise them money drugs accommodation anything to get them back to his farm once he got them back, he would then shoot or strangle them to death. And this next part is why he was given the name the Butcher. He would take the victim's bodies, chop them up, and feed them to his pigs. Now, if you're not aware of this already, pigs will literally eat anything. Everything. So the evidence was just, bye. They were getting rid of the evidence for him. All of a sudden, there is an increase in missing women in the area. But sadly, because he only went after sex workers or addicts or hitchhikers, no one cared. And this always makes me so mad with cases like these. Like, they're still human beings, but no bodies were showing up. So there was no crime, no body, no crime. But as the numbers started rising, people were kind of getting a bit worried. A group of people that weren't the police actually got a list together of all of the names of these young women who were missing. They brought that to the police and were like, do you see now? 
And that's when the investigation actually began into finding out what happened to these girls. And all of these girls had one person in common, Robert Picton. He was the only person whose name continuously came up when they were looking for these girls. Police needed a way to get onto the farm with a warrant without him knowing about it and hiding all the evidence first. And so they heard that he had possession of an illegal firearm. And so they used that as the cover up to get onto his property. On the property, they found multiple items that belonged to these missing women, along with some blood-stained clothing and tiny bone fragments. Now, things aren't looking too good for Robert, but because the pigs had eaten all the evidence, basically all of it, they were only able to charge him with the murder of six women. And so he got six counts of murder. When he got arrested, he actually said that he killed 49 women and that he was sad that he didn't get to round up to 50. What the hell, Robert? What does he want the police officer to say like, oh, I feel so bad for you. No! He was arrested in 2002 and this trial was huge. Of course, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. But guys, that's not the worst part of this story because I'm getting to that now. One element of the story that I kept out until now is that Robert, <laughs> Robert sold the meat of his pigs to people who lived around the area. These pigs who ate the remains of 60 women were sold to his neighbors. When I say neighbors, I just mean people who live in the area. So like secondhand, cam can secondhand cannibalism. I could never eat pig again if that was me. So yeah, they were pretty um, disturbed and freaked out by this information, which is uh, totally understandable and just totally disgusting. After a huge search of his property, police now believe that the number of women Robert killed was in the 60s. 60 women. 60 mother, daughters, wives. It's insane. It really annoys me with cases like these. I know it was like in 2002 and things have changed, but have they? I find that a lot of cases like these that I cover always start with, oh, all these women were going missing, but they were sex workers, but they were drug addicts, who cares? And it's like, it's insane to me that like they're not seen as equals to any other woman walking on the street, but whatever, hopefully that changes. And for those wondering, I have actually covered this story before, but the quality of the video was so, so bad that I just, I couldn't keep it up anymore. Like, it really bothered me to watch back, so I thought I would remake it in a higher quality way. I hope you guys enjoyed it regardless, and have a wonderful day. My heart goes out to every single one of the victims, their families, and people who cared about them, um, and I hope Robert rots in jail. Anyways. This is not a good representation of Canadians. We're actually really nice people. I'll see you all in the next video. Love you guys, bye. This is Peter Scully, one of the worst pedophiles in world history. I'm about to tell you his story, but seriously guys, this one is incredibly disturbing. It's so dark and viewer discretion is really advised for this video. So Peter Scully, he's still alive. He was from Australia. He had a family there, but he was engaging in criminal activities and he eventually fled the country and moved to the Philippines. And this is where the darkness really began. While he was in Australia, Peter Scully started up a international child sex abuse ring. The things that were done to these kids are, I mean, I can't even talk about them here on TikTok, but he also started up a pay-per-view video service. And with these videos, he was producing CP, but one of the most extreme forms of CP that can possibly be produced. So how did all this happen? Well, when he was out living in the Philippines, Peter Scully had two Filipina girlfriends. They would go out to the streets, they would find kids that needed money or looked impoverished. They would bring them back to the house they shared with Peter and the things that went on afterwards are literally unspeakable. Remember, like I mentioned before, Peter was the head of an international ring of people that enjoyed the abuse of kids and he provided videos for these clients but his most infamous video was titled Daisy's Destruction. This video that he produced was so extreme, so hardcore that people on the internet, when they heard about what happened in the video, literally thought that it was an urban legend and they thought that there was no way this could be real. This is an actual screenshot of the beginning of the video. This is a screenshot from the very beginning of the video. 
In the video, um, three young girls are repeatedly tortured for hours and hours on end by Peter Scully and his two girlfriends from the Philippines. They are beaten, they are sexually abused. I mean, I can't even describe, like I said on TikTok, some of the things that happened in this video. An 18 month old Daisy, now keep in mind that all of this was on camera. That's the most disturbing part of this. Um, one of Peter's victims actually ended up dying. They, they were buried in his house. And this sick, sick individual literally sold that video footage across the world. And what's even more disturbing is that there were lots of people willing to pay to see that video. I'm not kidding. People were paying $10,000 to view this video. That is absolute insanity that there are people that sick out there in the world. And this is only the beginning of the crimes that this guy carried out. Some of the other stuff that we're going to touch on is absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely, it's just horrific. And the story of how Peter Scully was eventually identified and arrested is extremely captivating. I'm going to run out of time here on this video, but if you want to see a part two, let me know below. This story is far from over.